we're going to get started. I think there may be some more people that are um, getting here. Uh, a little bit on the late side, but that's okay. I want to honor the time of those who have arrived early enough. So welcome, everyone. Um, we're really delighted that you have joined us on this rather chilly evening out there. Um, if anyone hasn't yet had cookies, we invite you to do so. Please feel free to get up at any point and get yourself something sweet and good to eat. Um, so we're welcoming you tonight to an evening that we're calling With Liberty and Justice for All. Hazen explores the art of civil discourse. We're calling it an educational evening of conversation and listening. Um, we want to take a little bit of time to frame the evening for you. Um, I don't know if folks have been on Facebook today, but there has been a lot of chatter out there about this event and what this process that we've been involved in in the school and some of the information that's been shared is misleading and incorrect. Um, so we're hoping that tonight um, we can bring you all on board um, to understand a little bit better what we are doing. Um, just one piece of information that might be useful for people to know is that I am a new principal here. I'm David Fargo. Um, I haven't met you. Um, and I arrived this, this past year, um, and the Pledge of Allegiance has actually not been cite, uh, recited here at Hazen High School for quite a long time, um, depending on who you are, at least a year and a half, or as many as several years. So the stories vary a little bit, but um, some of the chatter out there on the, the internet today was that I was the arch evil angel that was destroying the Pledge of Allegiance at Hazen School, and uh, quite the contrary, actually, to tell you the truth, and I think you'll understand that better when we have this conversation tonight. Anyways, I also want to introduce you to um, Elliot Kimball, who is a leader of our student council who's going to be co-facilitating tonight um, our event, um, and Allison Perry, who is here, who is the uh, faculty advisor to the student council. Um, we're delighted to have numbers of our staff here, numbers of our students here, and members of the greater community. So a great warm welcome to all of you tonight. Thanks for coming. Ellie. <clears throat> um, so just to introduce myself a little bit further, who I am, what I do, my name's Elliot Kimball. I'm a senior here at Hazen, and um, I'm, a, I'm one of the cabinet members of our student council. Uh, I'm a se uh, we have four seniors that kind of run our show from the cabinet level, and then we have two delegates from each grade, so we're 16 members strong and full strength. Um, Mr. Perigo came to us a couple months ago asking us if we wanted to co-sponsor this pledge project with him after there was interest from our student body, uh, asking where it went, why it's not here anymore, <coughs> things like that, and you'll see more about that as the presentation goes on. So uh, our pledge project, for the last several months, students and faculty at Hazen Union have been learning about, learning about and practicing the skills of civil discourse as we engage in a conversation about the role of the Pledge of Allegiance at Hazen. So uh, if I'm correct, I believe this all started um, with a student who asked why we no longer say it, some of the history behind it, and just a slew of questions followed, uh, conversations sparked, and our community was, was able to engage in discourse from all that. So this has been a tremendous learning experience for all, of, for all of us, and tonight we'd like to share some of that experience with you, our greater community. So thank you all again for coming, and I hope you enjoy. Um, so we want to be clear about our purpose tonight. Um, what we're doing is we're inviting our larger community to participate in an experience that was similar to what the students engaged in. Um, we created a structure. Each advisory was able to adapt that structure in the way they wanted, so this experience was a little different for different students depending on which um, advisory you were part of. But we had a general structure and a process of learning that we were engaging in. So we want to share a little bit of what, what we've learned with you tonight, and we want to invite you to listen, learn, and share from your own perspectives. So think of tonight as more like a classroom learning experience and a little less like a town meeting, if you will. So what do we mean when we talk about civil discourse? So this was my 435 definition that I came up with. I'm actually kind of proud of it. Um, 
think of it as respectful, skilled conversation that leads us to better understand and appreciate ideas and perspectives different from our own for the purpose of bettering ourselves, our community, and our world. So that's a simple definition about what we talk about when we talk about civil discourse. And the real project here was not just about the pledge. In fact, in some ways, it didn't have anything to do with the pledge. This was a project about helping our students learn the arts and skills of civil discourse. And I think if you've been alive in America for the last however many years, you might be concerned about the lack of civil discourse that's part of our society and our country right now. So we feel that this is something that's super important for not only our young people, but all of us in the community. So, so this whole idea of civil discourse has some big ideas behind it that are kind of cool. So I want to just share some of them. So one of them is that listening, listening, careful, precise listening is a beautiful gift that we can give to other human beings. It's very simple, yet it's very profound. And when we listen to understand, to understand others, to understand where they're coming from, to understand their perspectives, not to refute them, but re rebut them, we all grow as a result. Second idea, all voices are important. We've all been in conversations sometimes where the quiet person on the side doesn't get to contribute, where we don't get to know the quiet wisdom that they hold within them. Sometimes our loud, strong, passionate voices can inspire us and do wonderful things for us. But we also have to be aware that sometimes that passion and that strength silences other voices. So we want to acknowledge that and we want to invite and encourage and support <coughs> all voices as part of our conversation. So the last thing is um, expressing opinions is cool. We want to encourage our students to be articulate in expressing their opinions. But having informed, educated opinions is cooler. So, um, the very first thing that we did with our students was we established some ground rules. How are we going to be with each other so that we can have these conversations that will lead to civil discourse and not just arguments and fighting and disagreement? What are the ground rules? So tonight we'd like to brainstorm some ground rules with us, all of us. What are the things that you feel would be helpful and important for us to have in place before we begin this conversation? And Ms. Parody is going to record these things for us. So, this is the audience participation part of our evening. We will have many audience participation parts tonight. So, um, and we have a microphone here that we can run around. Um, it's not the Phil Donahue show tonight. <laughs> and it's Thank definitely you, not Perry. Jerry Springer either. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the, the good ground rules is, is just one person has the mic at a time, one person has the floor. Cool. Awesome. Great idea. Over here. I don't need the mic. Oh. Okay. I think it's important we have a moderator, perhaps yourself, Dave, and yeah. that you recognize people before they speak and that you try to ensure that, uh, that you don't go to a person a second time until everyone has had a first time to speak. These are like, this is town meeting yeah. type rules, That's and awesome. it seems to work out well. Great idea. The other thing that I just want to add to Ted's idea is if, when people speak, if they could identify who they are so that we'll all have a sense. Um, and maybe if you're a parent in the community or if you're a staff member or someone, you might just identify that as well so we know. Okay, a couple of great ideas. Other things, what else do we need? Hello, how are you folks tonight? Welcome. Very good, sorry for having Not a problem whatsoever, we've got plenty of seats left. Yes. I didn't just limit the time on the soapbox in the maintenance rooms. Okay. Great. Right, so the idea is to watch our talk time so that other folks can have an opportunity. Cool. How about curiosity? Bringing our curiosity to the conversation. Bring our curiosity. That's a great one. We love it. <coughs> yes? Stick to the point. Stick to the point? You get to the point. Cool. <laughs> get to it and stick to it. Yeah. I like it. Get to it and stick to it. Uh, I guess I'm the only one who uses the microphone. I really like the ground.
ground rule of uh, when somebody is saying something that could be controversial or kind of sticky, um, assume that people have good intent, but also understand that your words can have impact, even if it's not your intent to have a negative impact. Awesome. Did you get that? <laughs> assume best intentions here, good intent. Anything else? This doesn't have to be a, a, a volume here. This can just be a, short, a few short things that are going to remind us to kind of keep on track. Anybody have anything else? How are these? Are these good? Okay. So from time to time, what we might want to exercise is a timeout. So if I do timeout, folks, what we're going to do is we're just going to pause and we're going to revisit the things that we've all agreed to do. And we're going to maybe check out how we're doing with that. Without identifying anyone, we might say, well, you know, some folks are going on a little long, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So we may exercise that if we need to. All right. Next slide, please. All right. So the next thing that we did with our students was we started to frame our learning. We said, what are the questions that we might need to know if we were going to initiate a conversation about the Pledge of Allegiance and its role here at Hazen? What are some of the kinds of things that we might want to know? Right? So we're framing the questions first. So, brainstorm. What kinds of questions might we want to ask? I think there's one simple question. Why are you not doing the pledge? Okay. And that's why we're here. Okay. Fair enough. Sorry, can you repeat that? The format. So the question was, why are you not doing the pledge? Other questions? You are Mike. I think it's a good idea to know what the pledge means. Now, what does the pledge mean? And what's its history? Some of that's in this. But as I look around, some of us have gray enough here to remember it was a little different when some of us went to school. And some of us have gray hair and don't remember anything <laughs> at all. You're younger than I am. <laughs> Other questions? So, in school, we love to encourage kids to have questions, because questions have kinetic energy. They're vibrant. They go places. Answers just kind of land. But questions are really awesome. So what other kinds of questions might people have? Yes? I guess my question would be, why haven't our students been taught what the pledge means? OK. Why haven't our students been taught what the pledge means? Karina Colson, um, I'm from the American Legion Auxiliary. I'm the Department Vice President for the State of Vermont. Um, my, my question for you would be is, how can we teach the, the students at Hazen what the flag's meaning is? Is there something we can do to, to facilitate this? Great. So I hope as the evening goes on, we'll learn a little bit more about our process because we've been involved in exploring some of these questions for the last couple of months here. Thank you, Wendy Tanner, class of 1990 Hazen. Um, I guess my question would be is, where is the harm um, in saying or not saying the Pledge of Allegiance? Great question. <coughs> Matt Hill, parent. My question, uh, why the Harvard Elementary School says the Pledge in the morning? I'm Kai, and my question is, um, what are the reasons for saying it? Why do we, um, why do many schools say it in the morning? Kai is student here at Hazen. 
is kind of what happens in the educational process. You get on a roll, and the questions start rolling, and you start to develop an interesting set of questions that can then lead you to interesting places. I'm sorry, I'm sure this has already been iterated, but also, I guess it would be within the meeting, but the historic end of the flag and what it means and what it symbolizes for our country, you know, what's the importance of that for everybody to understand and know and, and saying it also in the morning. <coughs> Any others? I'm Amy Holloway, I'm on the Hayes and School Board, and my question is why is there so much disagreement about the role of the pledge? Uh, my question is um, if in fact uh, the Pledge of Allegiance is going to be said and you're pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, do all the classrooms in Hazen have a flag? And if not, why not? Okay. I don't need a microphone either. Okay. Um, I love these voices. They're <laughs> proud and they're speaking out. That's awesome. I, I wonder what 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 is the role of a school in this community? Wow. That's a big question, but honestly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that might be another yeah. night. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big question. But it, it's so. important yeah. the way we make these decisions, yeah. I think. Yeah. Do you need the mic? Oh, no. Okay. Instead of taking something away, why don't we give the option? <coughs> Great question. All right, so this is what we did. We developed a whole set of questions. Some of them are very similar to the questions that came up. So why don't we take a look at some of the questions that we came up with. Which is our next slide. Okay, so what do we know about the pledge? Um, and in a moment we're going to engage in the next step about that. But what might be good to know in order to make an informed decision about where we're going? What purpose does the pledge serve in a community? When and why was the pledge originally created? When and why was it changed? Is there anything about that time when those changes happened in history that can help us better understand our lives today? So those were some of the kinds of questions that came up in the course of this. So, next slide. All right, so then what we did with our students was we provided them with a whole bunch of different resources. We gave them lots of things to read, we gave them access to a bunch of videos. Um, we tried to find as many different things as we could with as many different points of view and let students sort of turn loose with this and see what they might learn because we wanted to have, we're a school, right? We want this to be about learning and growing. Um, so what we're going to do is watch one of the resources that we had. And when we asked the students to look at the resources, we asked them to think critically while they're reviewing the resource, to think critically about it and ask themselves, what part of this feels like facts that we can trust? And what part of this feels like there might be some bias to it, right? So when you watch this video, it's about nine minutes long. I'm quite sure there are probably some things in there that many of us may not know about already. But I want you to watch it carefully and see if you can identify any bias that might be there. And what parts of this are there facts that you might trust, right? And that's kind of a framework that we could bring to just about any kind of thing we might examine. So let's take this away here. <laughs> But neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. And before today's episode begins class, I'd like you all to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> kid, 
in elementary school, way back in the day, way, way back in the day. Um, the day would always start uh, in the same way. Someone would get on the loudspeaker and, uh, and they would lead the entire student body in a recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. And you guys know how the Pledge of Allegiance goes, right? You put your hand over your heart and you say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, as I got older, the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance became less and less frequent. Didn't do it in middle school, didn't do it in high school, certainly didn't do it in college. But apparently, Pledge of Allegiance is still said in quite a few schools across the country. But why? Why do thousands, if not millions of school children, kick off their day by reciting a Pledge of Loyalty to their country when some of them can't even do simple addition yet? No! That is very incorrect. And furthermore, if you don't recite the Pledge of Allegiance in class, could you get in trouble? Could you even be expelled from school? How about we dive into this tale, guys? I, I, I want to get into this one for a while. We take you back to the year 1891, where a young preacher, well, <coughs> this former preacher at this point, named Francis Bellamy, uh, gets a job working for a magazine called The Youth Companion, which has a subscriber base of about half a million people, and he gets a job in their promotions department. Now, one of Bellamy's tasks was to come up with a program that would commemorate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus landing in the New World. So did Bellamy sit down at his desk and begin writing a brief history of how Columbus came to the New World, and uh, he enslaved indigenous people, murdered indigenous people, and, uh, and stole away with some of their gold? <laughs> Instead, Bellamy went to work on coming up with a pledge that school children could recite to salute the American flag. And after about two hours of what Bellamy described as mental, arduous labor, uh, he came up with the following pledge. I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now here's an obvious question. Um, as I said in the beginning, Francis Bellamy was a preacher at one time in his life, and uh, if the guy was a preacher, why didn't he put the words under God in his first draft of the Pledge of Allegiance? And the answer is because Bellamy was not your typical preacher, okay? When he was a preacher in Boston, Massachusetts, um, a lot of his sermons to his congregation didn't really fall in line with what was traditionally preached in a church. And for that matter, because he was a socialist, a lot of his viewpoints didn't really fall in line uh, with capitalist viewpoints. And not only was Bellamy a socialist, but he was also kind of racist, because he wrote one time that in addition to capitalism in the Gilded Age, uh, he also wrote that, quote, every alien immigrant of inferior race, end quote, would mess up traditional American values. Also, here's something that I found uh, kind of funny. Bellamy, uh, being a socialist, was the one that wrote the pledge. <coughs> Meanwhile, the, uh, the owner of the youth magazine, a, a magazine mogul named Daniel Sharp Ford, uh, used Bellamy's pledge to, uh, to go ahead and make himself some extra cash. Ford decided to entice people to buy his magazine and to subscribe to his magazine by also offering them a, uh, an American flag. So every time someone subscribed to the magazine, they were given a brand new shiny United States flag. Capitalism via patriotism. Now, when you recite the Pledge of Allegiance, what other action are you performing during that recitation? You put your hand over your heart, right? Well, when, uh, when Bellamy wrote his original pledge, he, uh, he had another idea in mind as to how to salute uh, the American flag during the pledge, which would then be known as the Bellamy Salute. Bellamy defined his salute as thus, and uh, if there are any teachers that are showing this video uh, in class to their students, I would, I would warn you um, to make sure that you don't have your students perform the Bellamy Salute out of context, because it probably won't go over well with Anybody. At a signal from the principal, the pupils, in ordered ranks, hands to the side, face the flag. Another signal is given. Every pupil gives the flag the military salute. Right hand lifted, palm downward, to align with the forehead and close to it. Standing thus, all repeat together slowly, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At the words to my flag, the right hand is extended gracefully, palm upward toward the flag, and remains in this gesture till the end of the affirmation, whereupon all hands immediately drop to the side. Yeah, so all the... School children that you're seeing here performing what looks to be the uh, the, the Nazi salute that is that is not uh, baby Gestapo in training. Those are uh, those are American school children saluting 
the American flag. And they would continue to salute the flag in that manner all the way up until 1942, when this jerk over here had to go ahead and ruin it for everyone. And not only did he ruin the salute, but he also ruined that particular style of mustache. But before we change the salute from an extended right arm to hands over our hearts, there were a few changes made uh, to the words of the Pledge of Allegiance. Changes uh, that made the pledge more patriotic, uh, especially to immigrants that were coming to the United States, to kind of give them somewhat of a reminder that the flag that they were saluting was not their home country's flag, but would now be their adopted home country. In 1923, the My Flag part of the pledge was officially changed to the flag of the United States of America. And then in 1954, the words under God were added to the pledge, thanks in part to a lot of lobbying from a group known as the Knights of Columbus, which is a, uh, a Catholic organization. Plus, you also have to remember that in 1954, the United States was in the midst of a Cold War with the Soviet Union. And what was coming out of the Soviet Union? These godless communists that were going to try to infiltrate our shores, our our culture, our way of life, our people. So by adding under God, we reaffirmed that, uh, that we were in fact a Christian nation. It makes sense, right? However, it would be those words, under God, that had a father up in arms in 2004. In 2004, a father by the name of Michael Newdow, who was an atheist, sued his daughter's school district, which was the Elk Grove School District in California, saying that by having her stand up and recite the Pledge of Allegiance, which includes the words under God, it was a, a type of religious indoctrination and infringed upon the First Amendment of freedom of religion. His case would actually make it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the court ruled against Newdow, saying that because he didn't have sufficient custody of his daughter, uh, he could not make this type of case. Newdow and the daughter's mother were divorced at the time. She had sufficient custody. He did not. Oh, but 2004 is not the first time that the Supreme Court would hear cases regarding the Pledge of Allegiance. In fact, if you guys click this card right over here, it'll take you to a video that my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Beat, just put out that, uh, that talks about some of those Supreme Court cases uh, that took place in the 1940s. Those cases involved Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, how the Jehovah's Witnesses didn't want to uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance because it stood against their religious beliefs, and the final decisions of the Supreme Court. I could have discussed them here, but you know, he breaks it down much better than I do, so go ahead and watch his video. You'll, you'll thank me for it. But now that you have a history of the Pledge of Allegiance, how it came into being, why certain parts of the Pledge of Allegiance were added later on, um, what do you think? I'd love to hear from you. Do you think that the Pledge of Allegiance should be recited in school? Do you think that the words under God should be in the Pledge of Allegiance? Do you even think that the United States of America needs a Pledge of Allegiance? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And I know that this topic can get a bit dicey sometimes, so can we keep all the uh, commenting in the comment section a bit civil, please? Huh? We're all adults here, hopefully, maybe, maybe not. Regardless, act like an adult. Just Let's keep the conversation civil. And that, my friends, is it for this episode of US 101. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Really do appreciate it. And to all of you that have been subscribing to the channel, thank you guys so much for showing your support. I sincerely appreciate it. And thanks to all of you that watch the videos, like them, share them, and as always, leave comments in the the comments section. As always, guys, you can follow US101 on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and yeah, you can follow us on Snapchat too. All those links. All right. So this was just one of many, many things um, that we had available for students to look at and ask themselves the question about what part of this is facts that we want to trust and what part of this feels like a bias to us. Um, the thing that was really interesting was that the more we learned, the more we uncovered some interesting things that provided us things to follow up on, which is kind of what learning is when it's at its best altogether. So let's talk about this for a second. Bias. Did folks see bias? Hear yes. bias? Note bias? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the first bias that I noted was um, is talking about the Bellamy salute. Well, uh, I probably know more about the pledge than that fellow does. And the Bellamy salute uh, is misnamed. It could be called Hail Caesar, the Roman salute, or the Greek salute, because in those classical civilizations, that was a common and everyday form of salute. And once the Nazis, the fascists in 42, were recognized as using the Roman salute, it was immediately terminated as a means of uh, 
utilizing it during the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would say that his omission of that fact was an attempt to sway the audience to believe that there was a fascist beginning to the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. Great, thank you. Yes? Uh, I was just going to touch on that a little bit. <clears throat> My name is Mike King. I'm actually here to report this story, but uh, I'm also a history major at Johnson State. I'm in my final semester, and um, the Nazis did that with another symbol, the, the swastika, and they stole that from a number of different cultures, um, Indians, uh, uh, Native Americans, and it was always a symbol of peace. And uh, if you go to like a place like Deadwood, South Dakota, you'll see the swastika on a lot of gravestones, and they actually have a problem with that because people that are uneducated always knock over the stones, even though the stones say, died in 1807, so I think the bias here comes that he likened that salute to um, Nazi Germany, basically, where where when he came, when he adopted the salute for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, it didn't have the same connotation. So, um, and like Ted said, he he didn't didn't talk really about that, um, except for saying that he ruined the salute. He also didn't give the results of the Supreme Court cases that say um, it's basically your right to sit for the pledge. And that's a big part of what the pledge is. We see people kneeling uh, for the pledge. I'm a military veteran and, and I'm a graduate of uh, Hazen. And I fully support people kneeling for the Pledge of Allegiance. I mean, that is what the pledge is. It gives you the liberty to exercise a right. Uh, not to not to recite it or not to stand for it. So, other thoughts? Yes. Well, as far as continuing on with the salute, it's to my understanding and reading today that there are actually a couple salutes that went on after um, Hitler came about. There was one where they actually saluted the flag, and then one where they crossed their heart, and then also kind of saluted afterwards, and then it just went straight to the <coughs> heart. Um, so I, I also researched it a bit today to learn more about the salute. Great. Good. Other thoughts, ideas? We're going to follow Ted's rule here and make sure that That's everyone fine. has spoken. <laughs> That's fine. Um, before uh, anyone who wants to speak speaks before Ted speaks again. Yes. Hi. I'm Jennifer Tedesco. I'm the American Legion Auxiliary Junior National Vice President for the Eastern Division. Um, my question is, are we seeing another video? Because when I was in school going through this process, that was the only video that we saw. Um, so we weren't planning to see any other videos tonight. We did have someone who came with a video that asked if we could watch it. Um, but um, we can, if we want to see another video, we provided lots and lots of resources to the advisories, so they kind of got to pick and choose what they wanted to see. Um, and there was no particular reason that we showed this video tonight, except for the possible exception that there were a couple of chuckles in there that I thought it would be a little entertaining for people. But yes? I don't know that it's a bias, but it's YouTube. I'm sorry, what's that? So it's YouTube, right? So right. if all the facts are not backed up by documentation or, you know, right. that's always something to think about. So maybe not bias, but, you know, what, what facts are real facts. Exactly. So that's your next thing. Which is always super trust. important for young people to understand sure because yeah. there's so much information available, particularly on the internet these days, for them to become <laughs> facile in being able to evaluate information and its sources is super hugely important. I have to say, I'm also the Junior Activities um, Chairman for, for Harvard and for the State of Vermont, and Jen is one of my one of my wonderful juniors as well as, as Sarah and Paige, and they all go to this school. And that video is it's mortifying. I mean, we're we're showing our students that the flag and saluting the flag has to do with Hitler and things like that. And I just there has to be there has to be more to this. Um, I personally think that if it's the truth, then they should probably know it. 
It's not about opinions, it's about facts. Did you want people to know that you were Zola? <laughs> a student here, and they're so great. Um, can we go to a couple books here, and then we'll get back to you? I believe that. Okay. Um, she, the student over there refers to, if it was presented as fact, I look at anything on YouTube and Facebook as always not being truthful, and I have watched news conferences or been to activities where they are reported in the press entirely different than what I know happened there because of the bias of the author. And as Ted said, the salute that he referred to was not a Nazi salute. It was a pre-pre him, long time ago, with the Romans and the Greeks as a sign of honor. It was honor to be saluted that way until Hitler did it. And it's an honor to say the pledge until someone like this gentleman tears it apart. And I was appalled that that is the only thing that you have shown us because it is very definite that that guy's intent was to slam the pledge and you have nothing to counter it. And if what Jen said is true and most of the kids only saw that video, they have to assume it's true because their teacher showed it to them. Um, I would just like to say to that, as a student who went through this whole process to kind of analyze the pledge, we were shown many, many, many resources um, from both sides, from a neutral um, viewpoint, and I can assure you that that is not the only resource that we were given. Somebody up here just say something. So my name is Jan Mueller, I teach 7th grade social studies and I was pretty proud of uh, my advisory. Uh, and I would say the same thing, that you can, we can never eliminate bias, but we can only be open about our biases. And, and rather than showing one video, we chose videos that came from multiple perspectives. Um, and as a teacher though, I chose to leave the part out about, we didn't focus on the salute part because it doesn't seem as relevant to the conversation. So I both, I'm both trying to say that we try to do with bias in an open and honest way. Um, but then ultimately, we have to pick and choose, especially since my guys don't have the longest attention span. So we wanted to focus on what we're going to do with the pledge now. They didn't really want to talk about the history so much. They were interested about the different versions of the pledge, but this, this question about this salute um, wasn't as relevant. So. So maybe we could focus on, we really, the, what made it urgent for these guys was to uh, make it practical. What are we going to, what, what is Hazen actually going to do? Can we pass it up here, sir? Even, um, even though, like, we're focusing a lot on this loop, I do think that is an important thing to look at with the history, just because of the fact that right now, we're reliving that, not the not Hitler, but we're reliving the history of something becomes offensive to somebody, so we just fully take it away and then take away the original meaning. Um, the fact that I personally do not know the whole history of the Pledge of Allegiance, it bothers me because it is part of my country, um, part of my childhood. Um, I personally feel that it is very important to have due to the fact that there are so many people who give their lives and so many people who <coughs> we look at the past and we still hold on to everything. Not just the, bad, the good, but the bad too. And so the one thing that we have that we keep going with is tradition. And you keep you take away more if you take away more and more tradition, you take away the positive things of the past as well. The things that meant the most to people and meant a lot. You were asking about the biases and I also saw where they mentioned that he was a racist and I don't know what that had to do really with saying the Pledge of Allegiance back then was a whole different time. And I don't think that they really called them racist back then. Um, 
it, everybody had their own opinion. Everybody still does have an opinion. Um, and in a world, or at least a country right now, where we're seemingly quite divided, the flag is one thing that could be the glue that at least we all have in common. You know, it's the choice of whether or not to say it might be in your own hands. You can be respectful while others say it, you know, if you choose not to. But on the other hand, we live in a country together, we are all Americans. Why take away the symbol? It's, to me, it's the same thing as wearing a hazen uniform when you play basketball. It's a symbol, and it's a glue for a team, and that keeps them together. So that's what I want to say about that. Thank you very much. Hi. I'm Angie, I'm a mother here, and I just think it's great that the kids are watching videos with bias and learning how to identify it and tell the difference between bias and fact, because it's everywhere, and it's coming from all directions, so seeing all the sides and knowing how to separate it is really important. So maybe we can move on to the. Oh, sorry, Ted. Back to me. Sure. Okay, I don't need it. Oh. Uh, I think that the, the discussion about the salute was very interesting because uh, essentially the fascist took the Pledge of, of Allegiance salute as their own. It was also happened to be the Roman salute and the Greek salute, as I mentioned. So there's no nexus to fascism whatsoever. Uh, he did mention there was another bias that was interesting. He didn't talk about the voluntary nature of the Pledge of Allegiance. In 1943, during the height of World War II, when this nation was fighting for its national survival, maybe hard to imagine that being the case, but that's the way it was, the Supreme Court ruled that no one could be compelled to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. So that means that since 1940, I mean, what a great thing, what an affirmation of liberty and freedom that a government cannot compel anyone to recite the pledge, nor any other pledge. And that happened at the height of World War II. So today, even today, when someone refuses to recite the pledge, that is a great teaching moment. If it happens in a classroom and a student decides to sit it out, that's a great teaching moment for that teacher to point out to the remainder of the students who stood that the one who did not stand was exercising his constitutional right and we should all recognize that and be thankful that he has that right. So it's a teaching moment. Now that was in 1943. Additionally, in the 2010 case, and there was a mention of a name of a man by the name of Newdow, that was viewed as the final adjudication of the legality of the inclusion of the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. After that case, basically it began at the federal courts, the Supreme Courts refused to hear it, went back down to the federal courts, and their, their ruling stood. So that means the inclusion of under God is completely legal and constitutional. Today, the Pledge of Allegiance, as an outgrowth of that ruling, can be said in any venue, governmental or private, without any violation of the Constitution whatsoever. If somebody doesn't want to say it, you fall back on the 43 <coughs> Supreme Court ruling, which says you don't need to say under God. You can keep your mouth shut, you can sit down, not say anything. And that, to me, is one of the beauties of our country, that we afford the individual this ability to decline as much as we offer the others the opportunity to recite the pledge. So, thank you, Ted, and I'm listening to Ted, and I'm reminded that the sort of purpose of this whole evening is to bring people with different perspectives and different ideas together, and I think when we listen to each other, uh, we learn things, and I'm, I'm very appreciative for this, for this Anytime, Dave. Call me when you need to. Um, we'll go here, and then here, and then here, How's that? and then we're going to move on to the next step. <coughs> Yeah, my name is uh, Mike McGlynn, and, and uh, I'm with Barry Resident. One of the things that I, I find absent from this whole conversation is, is 
the ability for us to be here and having the, this conversation. And I feel that in a lot of cases, when people do do the Pledge of Allegiance, they're also showing some respect to, to our military members as well. And, and, and those who have given the ultimate. And Hazen itself has some, some alumnus who have given the ultimate. And I think in their own hearts, that's another way to show what is so much lacking in today's uh, society is the word respect. Uh, and I think that has to be taken into consideration as well. Um, again, Jennifer, American Majority Leader, Junior National Vice President. Um, to address one of the points, I'm sorry, I'm not, like facing more people. Um, okay. To address one of the points about there being more options for us to watch videos and to read articles and talk about it, we were shown one video. I'm not lying to you. We were shown one video, and that was the video. Nothing else. I'm very. I know Student Council provided a lot of stuff. They did. Good for them. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. But I was shown one video. That video. I'm not in student council. I don't ever plan to be in student council. I'm a senior. This is my last year. But that was it. I'm not lying. And I wrote down some stuff. We were asked when we were watching that video by the TSA that I was like sort of a guest in if we even wanted to see the other side. And it was asked in a derogatory way, like, do we even care about the other side? And like, I was like, yeah, I kind of want to see the other videos. That'd be pretty nifty. And they were like, oh, I'm just not going to watch it. Um, and when I asked the teacher if she had a flag in her room that if the pledge came back that we could say the pledge to, because she has a rainbow coexist flag and not an American flag, she said we could go to another room that we did not have to stay in her room to say the pledge, but we could leave. Imagine separating a student body by telling the people who want to say the pledge that they can leave. In what way is that equal? In what way is that right? You're not giving an opportunity. You're just saying that you have to leave your friends, you have to leave your classmates, and you have to get up and find another room that does not have a coexist flag because you're not going to pledge to the coexist flag, you're going to pledge to the flag of the United States of America, because that's what it says, to the flag of the United States of America. Jen, yeah, I just want to tell you how much we appreciate how well you articulated your concerns. I don't need the microphone. Okay. So I just wanted to make two points. I, I come from Europe, that's where I really grew up, so that salute to the flag means a whole lot of things to me than it does to you. And I would hope that we are not Greeks nor Romans. Uh, those societies are not something I thrive to be um, in anymore. So there's some history there, and we, we can't ignore that, if, you know, no matter who we are. Um, the second thing is I just hope that the students here feel comfortable actually having the right to sit down. So we're talking about students of all ages, from seventh grade and up, and it's a school. So sometimes there's a lot of group pressure at that particular age, and I hope that they understand the value and that they know that it's okay that they sit down. So I hope that that's obviously an educational thing that school can help with, but that's really important that they have that right even at that age. So maybe the next question, um, which is, did anybody have any new thoughts as a result of watching this? Did, you, did anything occur to you? Did you get any information that maybe you didn't have before? Actually, and I can speak loudly too, one thing is that I have realized is that a lot of people do not understand what the pledge is about and why it is said. And I can tell you the video that she brought is very short and is entertaining, but it explains it word for word what the pledge means. So if you wouldn't mind showing it, um, I think it would be great. Okay. Um, so maybe we could um, see if we could um, move on with the agenda, and if there's time for that, if people want to stay, we can we can add that in. Yeah, well. that will answer even for young kids. It's yeah. Um, so one of the things I want to say is that in response to the um, opportunity to explore this, many of our students did learn a whole lot about things that they had no idea about, and I did too. And 
I thought that was a really interesting and um, cool project. So, yes. Dave, I just have a question after listening to what Jen said. Obviously, her advisor was very anti-pledge and very biased. And I have heard other stories of that happening with teachers at this school on political issues. And we had said this was not going to be political. But our education of our children should not be political either. And it was very obvious that hers was. And I would hope that as a result of this meeting and the public being aware of both sides of the story, which is always good to have, as long as both sides are factual, that in a classroom, a student is given the opportunity not to be shamed if they sit or stand either way by the staff, and that that direction comes from the school board and from the administration in this building, that we are proud to be Americans, and we have the right to stand or sit. And how you look at it is your personal belief, but as an instructor in this line of business, you cannot put forward your personal ideas. You have to let the children develop their own to become adults as we have. Right. And to realize that a negative person will create negative children. And that we need to stop that before it goes any further. Because it is happening here. That's a good point. And I think one of the things that we would all, who are committed to this profession of teaching, would probably agree that our jobs is to help students learn how to think not what to think. That we yes. encourage them, we encourage that yeah, in every aspect. I, I'm, so I, uh, I didn't think it was a great video, but <clears throat> just because I probably wouldn't have, I would have been hard to impress one way or the other about it. Um, but I kind of took it as actually somewhat neutral. I didn't, uh, I didn't read into the same level of bias around the salute that, uh, that I, I'm hearing other folks feeling strongly about. Um, so I'm, I'm curious sort of about uh, a little bit more about how, how uh, this, what else this aroused in folks about feeling of bias. I, I personally interpreted the historical part of the salute as just a bit of a historical reference to um, you know, something that was and no longer is. Um, and I'm sure there's more to the story and maybe there were other iterations of the salute itself. I don't think in three minutes you could capture a comprehensive history one way or the other. So I, personally, I, you know, it probably wasn't well done. There's a lot more to the story. I think if somebody were arguing against the pledge, they could come up with a much better argument than that video and somebody arguing for the pledge could come up with a much better argument. So I'm, I'm very curious about the, the strong sense of bias around the presentation uh, because I actually didn't really pick up on it. I just felt it was kind of on the flimsy side. Well, no, I'm just being, you know, just, I'm, but I am curious. Like, it really did seem to arouse some emotions in here that, uh, that I, I'm sort of finding myself a little surprised by. So I'm, I'm curious to hear more about what, uh, what, what else was coming up as, coming across as being biased in that. Anybody want to respond to that? I don't need the microphone. Sure. Um, part of public speaking and part of uh, having a convincing argument, anyone that's ever written a thesis can tell you, is uh, word association and ideal, idea association. And uh, he does say that it was changed after the Nazis adopted this loop, but just the fact that he brings the Nazis into it for so long in the video, obviously you're an uh, analytic viewer and you're, you have critical thinking skills so you see it and you don't see the bias because you look beyond it but someone walking away from from that video that maybe doesn't have those critical thinking skills or those analytic skills here's Nazi Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I don't think I think the video was poorly done too but I don't think he had to spend uh, the majority of the video talking about that salute there's a lot of other things and there's even there is better arguments against the Pledge of Allegiance than uh, liking it to um, Nazi, the Nazi party. Great, thank you. Um, and just so that people are clear, um, we didn't choose this video because it was a good video particularly. We chose this video because we thought it was a good exercise in allowing kids to sort of become aware. <coughs> That's why we picked it. Um, 
Yeah, I can, I can talk loudly. Um, so that was the first video I showed my advisory, and I showed them several, um, and I found that it uh, provoked the biggest number of questions. Actually, I kind of had a lot of questions when I was previewing all of the videos and trying to decide which ones to share with my 10th graders. Um, and it provoked a lot of questions, and it provoked a lot of research. So this video in and of itself, even though it wasn't terribly well done or educational, um, it was worthwhile in the sense that it, it made my students want to know more. Um, and I think that's another reason why we chose it this evening. And, and as we stated, this is a learning process. This is us wanting to get more information, get to the bottom of this. And also off topic, um, slightly off topic, one question that we kept on coming back to, which I don't think has been mentioned tonight, is um, what is what are we actually pledging to? Because there's this, there seems to be a little bit of a divide in this community. Are we pledging to our country, um, or are we pledging to the troops that support our country? And it, it's, a, I think it's a combination of both. But I think some people um, see it in one way or the other, and that's an important um, thing to address what are what are we actually pledging our support to I don't think there's a single person in this community that says that they don't want to pledge support to people who fight for our country I don't think anybody says we're not going to support you uh, thank you soldiers but there is a lot more to the Pledge of Allegiance than just supporting soldiers there's a whole history Thanks. all right maybe um, I can do without the microphone. Okay. Patricia Tedesco, parent, uh, community member. It's sort of off topic, but I'm kind of wondering where are we going with this? Like, I'm not trying to be rude, but like, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. Are All we right. voting, deciding? So, Is it, What's happening? What's the end result of okay. tonight's meeting? So I think you'll see in a few moments when we get on where, where we're going. Okay. We have a section here about next steps. So um, can we, did, did you? Just quick. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Karen Collier, I'm a parent. Um, and I just want to reiterate that if your student comes home and expresses that they saw something in a classroom that they weren't happy with, that's the time for we parents to have a conversation with our kids about our belief system. It's not the school's responsibility to teach our belief systems to our children. I will teach my child our belief systems. When she grows up, she can do what she wants with that. While she's under, under my home, she's she going to pretty much believe the way we believe. But um, we often put that emphasis on school, and there is that. But there's also, it's not the school's responsibility to teach them our morals and our beliefs. When, if Sarah had come home and said that to me, I would have gotten on the phone with David and said, just want to make you aware, this is what happened. I've had a conversation with Sarah, we're all set, but you might want to have a conversation with the teacher. So if you feel like when you, at any time, you see or hear something that you really aren't comfortable with, I have to leave his doors open for you to hear it. I know that we want to be respectful of people's time, so we're going to move on shortly, but we're going to let Ted weigh in here. Okay, very quickly. Uh, we want to get to a bottom line, which is, why do we say the pledge? And I mean, what's the purpose of it? And who's it directed to? Uh, well, we're one American family. Left, right, conservative, liberal, and every other uh, shape and color. So what does the pledge do for us? Well, it represents an expression of ideals. It doesn't necessarily say, this is the way it is, liberty and justice for all. We all know in our life experience that sometimes that is not achieved. And here's an opportunity for your people, Dave, your teachers, after the recitation of the pledge, your teachers should say to the students, not every day, maybe once a week or once a month, after the recitation of the pledge, what have you done to achieve these ideals? in your life, in your community, in your state and country. You see, use it as a teaching moment. Otherwise, you just leave this hanging for the students to try to figure out, well, what the hell was that all about? You know, let the teacher bring it to life. Let the teacher ask the student, what have you done 
to achieve these ideals expressed in the pledge. And you'll get, well, I saw this and that was bad. Okay, well, what did you do to change that? Did you communicate with your legislator? Did you protest, which is fine in this country? What have you done to achieve the ideals? And that then will create the American family a stronger bond amongst all of us. And that's what I think the pledge does. And to the question, who are we pledging? It says, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The flag is the embodiment of everything. It's the Constitution. It's the people. It's our traditions. You're not pledging allegiance to the Marine Corps or the Army or the Navy, but you're pledging allegiance to the flag which embodies all. But I think your teachers need to get actively involved after the recitation of the pledge, every so often, ask them, what have you done to achieve these goals, these ideals that you've just pledged allegiance to? That's a Great. teacher's job. That's awesome. Thanks. I love the idea about our common ground and the idea of living for ideals. I think that's awesome. Um, can we move to the next section quickly? Uh, she doesn't know my password. Got it, got it posted on the computer? <laughs> I thought it was on Facebook today. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, we did that. Okay, so here are some of the things that came up in the conversation. And what's cool is that the questions that get generated, we could go on forever. These are great questions. Um, here are some of the ones that came up in the course of our conversation. Some interesting ones. Um, but a good education loves good questions. Questions take us places. They explore. They help grow young minds. And when we have a community that has strong skills of social and civil discourse, and kids can build trust with each other and go deeper, that's a great education. So that's one of the goals that we're working towards here. Next slide. Um, so I think we've spent a fair amount of time on comments and contributions tonight. So um, I'm going to skip to the next section and um, share with you kind of where we're going in answer to um, our friend's question here. So all of the students in their TSAs, or most of them, at least have submitted proposals about how we should move forward. Um, our plan is to review those proposals on Monday with the Student Council and then develop a plan for how we're going to move forward. What I want to share with you I think is really interesting um, because there is a very strong common ground between all of the proposals that came in. And I think this is something that we could all be very proud of and it references some of the comments that were made tonight. Every single TSA, and how many do we have in the school? About 24. 24 different groups of young people, all somewhere between 12 and 16 in number, came up with this idea independently. Anyone at Hayes and Union that wants to say the pledge should be able to do so. And that experience should be respected by all others. Any student at Hazen who chooses not to say the pledge should be supported in doing so, and that should be respected by all others. That was part of every single student response. And I think that's something we can very proud of. So, um, that's kind of where we were going with this. Um, that's what we're doing, and I expect that sometime within the next week of time or so, we will have this as part of our community again, and in a way that will be much stronger. Students will have a much better understanding of it, of a role, of its role in our, our world. And in the process, I think we've grown as a community. And I want to share with all of you that I'm very encouraged by tonight because we as a community here at Hazen and we as a Hardwick community and we as a country 
have a lot of really important things that we have to move forward with. And if we can have conversations that bring people together of very diverse points of view and background and talk the way we have tonight, civilly, and being able to understand each other's points of view, then we have achieved something really remarkable. And that's what education should be all about. Because we want to have hope for our kids that the world they're going to live in is going to be a better, stronger world than the world that we live in. So thank you all very, very much for participating in that. I think had something we want to say. There was a proposal that a short, yes. a short video be shown to people once. So um, if we can do that technically, we would be happy to do that. And we invite anyone who wants to stay for that can stay for that. But we certainly don't want to trap anyone here. So what have you got? Is it on a... I've, we've seen that, actually. Yep. Great. If we can... Um... Red skeleton? Yeah. Skeleton. 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 Yeah. Skeleton. Yeah. He's, a, yeah. he's a comedian from back in the day. I used to watch him on TV. I hope I'm not dating myself. So is it safe to say? Well, I remember. I think I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Hang on. Sorry, we'll be doing the pledge. I'm sorry. Um, I think it, it is safe to say that very soon students who want to participate in the pledge at Hazen will have the opportunity to do so. Why not tomorrow if all those people said yes? Because we want to follow the process that we agreed to that we were going to do, and. The process is the student council is going to get a chance to review all. The okay. only person who's seen all of the proposals is myself right now. Okay. So we want to share that with everybody else. Dave, yep. hey, will it be over the PA system? We're not sure yet. We're, that's part of our proposals. We're, we're, you have to be careful you don't make it too difficult for the, those people who wish to. We're not going to make it. Exciting. We're not going to make it difficult. This is something that we feel is important. Yep. So we're yep. not going to. We're looking forward to do, doing a, a solid block of, at our next student, we meet every Monday, our student council does, we're going to spend the entire meeting concentrated work figuring out um, how to bring it back, what ways to bring it back, and I think by Tuesday or Wednesday our school will be able to see the results of that. So. Thank you. If you could post that on cool. Facebook and let us know or somehow. Okay, that would be great. Great idea. Yeah, you want to just say one last thing before we move? I just want to say that this, 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 like this principle of mutual respect for the people who want to say it and not say it, we all agreed, we all snapped, that this, but doing that in practice, not easy. My, my TSA focus, how do we make everyone feel comfortable? If one person's uncomfortable, we have failed in this process. You can know. I so we are, so I'm just saying time is worth the time you to. You have not failed. Have you, you have not failed. You need to refine perhaps your own presence and your own instructions, but you have not failed. You cannot turn away from a, from an activity because one person objects or, or, or says no, he feels I'm, uncomfortable. That's not really I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that we, well, maybe the one person part, don't be distracted by that, but we didn't want this, this exercise to divide the school. We wanted it to be yes. a unifying yes. thing. Yes, yes. An inclusive And respect thing. the rights of both sides. Right. Yes. So, yes. I'm going to... And it's more than just well, two sides, but I would say. I'm going to let the last word before we watch Red Skelton uh, come from one of our esteemed seventh graders. Um, I would just like to bring up the fact about what we said when we were making rules at the beginning of this presentation, is to let others speak, and I would really appreciate it if you would follow that rule. That goes for me, too, because I've done my share of talking tonight. All right, so um, let's watch the Red Skelton video, and then uh, we'll call it an evening. I remember a teacher that I had. Now, I, only, I, went, I went through the seventh grade. I went to the seventh grade. And I left home when I was 10 years old because I was hungry. I used to, this, this is true, I work in the summer, I go to school in the winter. But I had this one teacher, he was the principal of the Harrison School in Vincennes, Indiana. To me, this was the greatest teacher, a real sage of, of my time, anyhow. He had such wisdom. 
And we were all reciting the Pledge of Allegiance one day. And he walked over, this little old teacher, Mr. Laswell was his name. Mr. Laswell, who is, is uh... <laughs> He says, I've been listening to you boys and girls recite the Pledge of Allegiance all semester. And it seems as though it's becoming monotonous to you. If I may, may I recite it and try to explain to you the meaning of each word. I, me, an individual, a committee of one, pledge, dedicate all of my worldly goods to give without self-pity, allegiance, my love and my devotion to the flag, our standard, O oh glory, a symbol of freedom, wherever she waves, there's respect, because your loyalty has given her a dignity that shouts freedom is everybody's job. United. That means that we have all come together. States. Individual communities that have united into 48 great states. 48 individual communities with pride and dignity and purpose all divided with imaginary boundaries, yet united to a common purpose, and that's love for country. And to the Republic, Republic, a state in which sovereign power is invested in representatives chosen by the people to govern. And government is the people, and it's from the people to the leaders, not from the leaders to the people for which it stands. One nation, one nation, meaning so blessed by God, indivisible, incapable of being divided with liberty, which is freedom, the right of power to live one's own life without threats, fear, or some sort of retaliation, and justice, the principle are qualities of dealing fairly with others. For all. For all. Which means, boys and girls, it's as much your country as it is mine. And now, boys and girls, let me hear you recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Since I was a small boy, two states have been added to our country, and two words have been added to the Pledge of Allegiance, under God. Wouldn't it be a pity if someone said that is a prayer and that would be eliminated from schools too. So thank you very much for bringing another resource to the conversation tonight. We really appreciate that. Um, the one last thing that I want to clarify for folks tonight that I think is important is that this conversation came about because students brought this to our attention. And a school that allows students to bring their ideas forward is a school that I think has the potential to be a really powerful and wonderful place. And two of those students are present with us tonight who were part of that original group of people. And I want to commend and thank you for helping our whole community grow the more powerful our student voices are and the more that we can allow them to rise and be heard, the better we all are for it. So thank you guys very much. Hey, Dave, should I get the mic? Sure. I, I just wanted to thank Dave for uh, hosting the conversation throughout the school and the evening. I think uh, you're new to the community. I think you're doing a really great job. I think you really uh, get 
what schools are for and what it means to foster a community and a sense of uh, the responsibility of learning and becoming educated. And so um, I wanted to say welcome just publicly and then also thank you. And with that, I thank you again all for coming and I wish you a safe ride home and let's keep these conversations going.